Welcome to Vale la Pena. In English, that's worth your while. I'm your host, Cynthia Rebus. This is a show where we get to do some grassroots philanthropy together. In all episodes, we'll feature nonprofit organizations engaged in inspiring projects for people, animals, and the environment. Some guests will be representatives of those organizations and they'll share with us more about initiatives they're working on and ways we can participate. Check the show notes for opportunities to impact these humanitarian causes together. You can find this show through my website at www.rebuslegal.com and on YouTube, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Now, please join me for Vale la Pena. Hello and welcome. I'm Cynthia, and I am so excited that you have tuned in to our show. And today, you know, we are about grassroots philanthropy. And today we are showcasing the Ironwood Pig Sanctuary. And our guest is Mary Shands co-founder of the sanctuary so hello mary hi so hi, happy welcome. you can join us i am too <laughs> get a little of uh, the word out about our sanctuary <laughs> yes and so you have been operating your sanctuary you co-founded it now tell us a little bit about how you got into this well, I was in animal rights activities for quite a few years, and uh, I was becoming very depressed and angry all the time and felt I needed to do something that I could try to make a difference in. You know, there's just so many issues in animal rights. So um, I saw an article in the newspaper back in the late 1900s, 1998 or something like that. and um, uh, my husband is an engineer and I am the animal person, so we decided we would go help this lady out because she was pretty desperate and um, that's how we got involved. She had she had about 80 pigs, I think, at the time at her prop on her property. And so we went there and volunteered and built infrastructure and helped her take care of the animals and um, at, for, till 2000 and in 2000, we decided to purchase our own property and open our own sanctuary because there were so many calls coming in and she only had a small property and um, it was such a huge need, we decided. And we had fallen in love with the pigs, <laughs> particularly a few that we really had grown uh, very uh, attached to. So we decided we would start our own place and um, open a sanctuary of our own. So we bought 40 acres outside of Marana and started to build the sanctuary. And that's how we got and started. So you're in Arizona, you're near Tucson, is that right? Yes, we're about an hour out of Tucson, approximately an hour out of Tucson. Between, okay. We're between and closer to Tucson. the calls that come in around the pigs, where do they come in from? They come in from everywhere. Uh, emails and call, phone calls from uh, uh, people that have to give up their pig because someone has died or they just don't want them or uh, they're moving. That's probably the biggest the biggest reason people are moving and they can't take the pig with them. Uh, and then there are many, many hoarding situations that we get calls from the uh, authorities that you know someone has moved out and left all these animals with no water and no food, that kind of thing. So um, they just come from all around the, I, I have one today from the agriculture department up near Phoenix. There's a stray pig in the neighborhood in Casa Grande. They want us to come get it. He's gonna try to capture it and then, uh, but he won't bring it down to us. So we have to try to work out picking the pig up. So uh, the last year or two, the hugest, the biggest problem we see in the last year or two are abandoned and stray animals. Um, and so those have to be a priority. So a lot of the people that privately want to release their pigs, we uh, we are not able to take a lot of them because we can only take so many. And 
if people have taken pigs off the street and put them in their yard and call us, then we have to try to make that a priority. So they come from all around, all over Arizona, uh, New Mexico sometimes, California sometimes as well. So it's a huge overpopulation problem. And do you attribute some of it to the pandemic? Are there more now or it's just been this way for a while? No, I don't attribute it. I attribute it to the lies and the frauds about micro mini pigs and the teacup pigs. That, that's what got everybody going. So, uh, you know, the breeders get, I have tons of websites and they say they're going to be 30 or 40 pounds and they're just like dogs and, um, and everybody's gotten on the bandwagon, you know, all the backside backyard breeders and, you know, trying to sell them as mini pigs. And um, of course they're not. So uh, that's what I, that's what I attributed to primarily the hugest, the biggest problem. Yeah. We were hoping uh, as we went into the early 2000s that, that uh, the fad would sort of fade away and that, you know, with attrition and whatever, we could, we would be able to, uh, we would be able to handle the number of pigs that people were in need of giving up. But um, with the micro mini, uh, fr fr you know, the big rage with micro mini pigs, it just, uh, it's just overwhelmed the population of pigs in the, in the country. So just to clarify for people, then it's that now people are wanting pigs as pets and they wind up buying a pig that perhaps has been underfed or is otherwise a baby and they have no idea about the pig's growth. And so then it winds up growing to be too big. And then the next thing you know, he's abandoned. Is that what we're talking about? Yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, these people that have these pigs, they, they literally starve them. I mean, literally starve them. And, and we get them in often uh, so emaciated and, and they end up with chronic problems uh, in their, uh, their joints and everything because they have not developed correctly because they've, they've fed them so little to keep them small. And uh, they're not even cute. I mean, they're just emaciated. They look awful. And, um, but often people get them, they, they are humane people and they won't follow that. And, and so they'll feed them normally and they, they grow into a 150, 120 to 150 pound pig, which, um, which is the normal size for a pot belly pig. And um, so that's, that's what happens a, an awful lot. And people, they just don't, they don't have, they weren't prepared to have an animal that was 150 pounds going around their house <laughs> and rooting into everything, <laughs> into the couches and the, and the, and the floors, to, you know, linoleum and ripping down walls and curtains. And <laughs> so that's, that's a, a lot of what has happened. I, I've, I've been told, I don't know if it's true, but I've been told that I've read that 90% of pet pigs end up being rehomed if possible of, of what people get so that's a it's a huge problem so the message for people is if you want to have a pet you want to have a pig as a pet you really need space right you really need first maybe if you're on a farm and your farm is zoned right you got to check the zoning and yes. then my guess is you probably need enough room so the pig has a pen because trying to have a pig inside your home is not going to work. It works for some people. It does. Okay. I can't, I can't say it's a hundred percent. There are some people that have their pigs in their home and, and throughout their life, maybe they're just indoor outdoor. Uh, but I think for all fairness to the pig, yes, here's, here's what I would recommend. Number one, you have to check your zoning. You brought that up because pigs are not allowed in a lot of places. Most, you know, many, many communities and cities do not allow pigs. And um, so, so you have to check that before you start. 
and particularly HOAs. Uh, we get so many calls from people that have pigs and they move into an HOA and someone turns them in and then they have to give their pig up or move. So you got to check your zoning. You need to uh, you need to know what the requirements are for a pig. We always ask people to come out here and visit, see what pigs need. They, they need plenty of shade. They need shelter at all times of day, shade at all times of day. They need secure fencing. They need security from dogs. They need space. Uh, so many pigs that we pick up, they're in tiny little 10 by 10 or 10 by 12 pens. And, that's, and they're very intelligent animals. And it's a horrible life for them. It's really an isolation and a terrible life for them. And they, they get obese because they don't get any exercise. And then that just catapults into arthritis and all kinds of health issues. So, yes, and they need companionship. That, that's one of the biggest things for me. Uh, we, we do not adopt a single pig. If, if they don't have a pig already and they, uh, uh, we do not adopt one pig. Uh, they, if they have a pig and they want a companion for their pig, then, then we're willing to do that. But pigs um, are really herd animals and they really need each other. And people don't understand that. A lot of the breeders will say, just take this pig, it'll bond with you. Well, it will, but that's, that's not gonna be a happy pig. In fact, um, pigs often become aggressive from single home pigs. Um, they usually start becoming aggressive around 10 to 12 months. And this cute little wonderful pig they had that slept in their bed or whatever is suddenly biting them and trying to control them because uh, that's what they do. They, they, they are herd animals and they want, to, um, they want to control their herd. And if their herd happens to be children or people or people that come into their house that, that they don't know, they'll go after them a lot of times. So I won't say that 100% of single pigs uh, are aggressive, but I would say close to 100% of aggressive pigs that we get come from single pig homes. So that's okay, one of so, the really important things to consider. So it sounds like it kind of like dogs, they're very social animals, right? So they really need to be uh, ideally with other pigs, right? Because you mentioned yes. dogs might not be, you know, trying to, there might be issues with other species, right? Yes, especially dogs. Uh, but pigs are generally pretty good with most animals. It's the opposite that happens. I mean, you'll see, you know, cats will become good friends. Even dogs on occasion, they, they do have, there are times when a dog and a pig are, are great companions. But the fact is, pigs are prey animals and dogs are predators. And we get more animals in here from dog bites than I can count. Ears gone, tails gone. It's it's really um, it's really a huge problem, and it's not just the strays. It's people that own dogs, and uh, maybe they were even friends for years, and something set the dog off. Maybe the pig got caught on something and started to squeal, or who knows what happens. But uh, fifty percent of the dog bite or the pig bites that veterinarians get in are from owned animals uh, you know they're not on stray animals from the streets so it's something you have to be very cautious of when you when you have a pig and most people that want to adopt a pig have dogs so we just try to have to caution them that if you're not present you should not ever leave that pig alone with your dog so that's one thing we um, talk to people about other issues with with pigs as pets um, Pigs grow up, and and they go from these little babies that you can easily take to the pet, to take to the vet. But once they're 100 pounds or 150 pounds, and they don't want to get into a, a a crate or a car or whatever, people can't transport them to vets, and that's so that's a huge problem for the for the owners of these animals. And there aren't a lot of veterinarians that take care of pigs, so it really limits. Uh, your ability to give your animal good health care. And um, we get calls from our vets because people call and they say, my pig is sick, I can't get it to you. So the vets re 
they refer them to us. When we are able, we, we do transport the pig for the people, but we're not always able to drop things in and take off and go pick their pig up. So it's a difficult situation for people that uh, their own pigs and all vets won't come out. Often they, they're not gonna come out. And even if they do come to your home as a mobile vet, they frequently don't have the equipment they need, the x-rays and the fluid, you know, the equipment they need to deal with a sick pig and uh, find out and to diagnose it. So do the blood work and all the rest. So it's better if they can go to the clinic when they're sick. So those are some of the, those are some of the issues um, that we see a lot, you know, is a, and a pet pig. Um, the zoning issues, the companionship with another pig becoming aggressive, veterinary care. Um, so those those are a lot of things that um, the people have to consider. And I would say it's really important to do your homework, you know, and and to come out and see our place if they were in in this area. Um, because they'll destroy your landscape. <laughs> I mean, I I have had people want to adopt and I say, no, your place is too nice because you get a pig there and it's going to tear up your flowers and your yard and uh, and then you're going to be mad at the pig and it's not the pig's fault, <laughs> you know? It's just that uh, they're pigs and they're not dogs. And as I said to you the other day, you can't make a a dog out of a pig, you know, no matter how big or little they are. They're, they're uh, rooters. They love to root and um, they love to dump things and root things up and <laughs> your plants and your flowers and your trees and whatever. So there's just a lot of, a lot of complications that people don't know about or don't read about when they go to the uh, websites of people that sell and breed pigs. So in terms of doing our homework, tell us a little bit so the listeners know volunteer opportunities. If they come to your place, what what can we do to help? Well, a lot of that depends on how often they're going to come and, you know, what kind of commitment they're going to make. Um, if people write and say they want to volunteer, they'll come out, you know, they'll come out for a day or a few hours or something. I usually just have them help break a field you know, because there's a lot of raking to do with 650 pigs. And, you know, we'll just set them up with some bags and the ATV and and, uh, and they can rake. If they're going to come on a regular basis, then they can help do a lot of things. They, they can um, not feed so much because that is a pretty complicated system with us. We do a, a lot of special foods and meds and all that. But all, all the pigs that eat in pens in the fields, they have to have the bowls picked up and rinsed and cleaned and they can help water. And, you know, so there's there's a lot to do if you're going to come on a regular on a regular basis. But um, if you're just coming for an afternoon or something, it, it would just be raking. And and we have lots of uh, supplies that are donated that have to be sorted. And and some of it is just just giving attention to some of the pigs. I mean, honestly, we have some really sweet pigs, a lot of really sweet pigs, and they they don't get a lot of individual attention because we don't have the staffing or the time. You know, we have 650 pigs that feed and take care of, always sick pigs with that many. And uh, so even just going out into a field and picking out a pig that needs uh, some petting and then the others will just gather around and they'll start with their hair coming up and they'll uh, roll over for belly rubs. So sometimes that's just something to do as well. So, so some socialization. So let's say we want to do that. We want to go and see some of the pigs and learn and, you know, do our homework about what it really is to care for a pig. And would we just go on your website then and fill out like, a volunteer application? Yes, yes. Okay, we will link um, that to the show notes. Yes. So and, listeners and can have the person who, direct access. Who man, yeah, the woman who, who does our website, or who does our emails for us, she will send that to me, volunteer opportunity, and it'll it'll list that, you know, what they've filled out and what, what days they might be available or when they might be available. I try 
because we don't have a volunteer coordinator and we're very short staffed, it's sometimes difficult to fit people in because it does take time away from us. But um, what I try to do is tell them to come out for tour first, sign up for tour. Um, and uh, because then when they do come to volunteer, they're ready to volunteer, you know, because people come to volunteer and they haven't seen the place. And of course, you know, you feel sort of obligated to take them around and show them the place. And, and then there goes the time by, you know, so, uh, so I, I like, if possible, I like to have them come and take an official tour with our tour guide and see the place. And then, and then if they're ready, they can come back and set up an appointment and come back. And then I can, you know, just get them out into a field raking or what, whatever else comes up, depending on what their time requirements are, restrictions. So that's kind of- And then you have really tours on a regular basis and that's also on your website, right? Your tour times? It is. Right now, right now, we're not doing tours on Saturdays because we have an illness here that we are dealing with, with pigs. And uh, not only is it taking additional staff time, but we don't want to risk anybody coming on that may have a pig at their home or something. And and it, it could possibly go to them. So we're we're working day and night on trying to deal with, with this. So we've canceled the last three weeks, but we do tours usually through the winter, beginning October and usually through the end of April and on Saturdays. And uh, we try to adhere to that the best we can. That's the best time of year. Summertime is is just prohibitive. I mean, it's brutal out here. So we, we don't, act, people really can't do it. So, and we can't do it because we, we just have enough stress dealing with the heat. So we do it through usually the end of April, try to handle. So that's, and they go on the website and they can sign up. Right, exactly. And are there um, other sanctuaries? Um, I'm thinking your, yours is the biggest in Arizona, right? Ours is the biggest in Arizona. Ours may be the biggest in the country. I don't know, but I don't know of any other sanctuaries that are larger than us. Um, yes, there are other sanctuaries. There are other sanctuaries in Arizona. Uh, there's a quite a, quite a large one in uh, Cave Creek, and uh, there's uh, one in Maricopa, and uh, maybe two even in Maricopa. So there there are other sanctuaries. Most of them, some of them are fairly large, but um, but no one that has 650. <laughs> uh, but but and some of them are just small rescues, you know, where they might have 10 or 12 pigs or something that that are, you know, that are rescued. We also have foster homes. We have quite a number of foster homes. And so that helps to take up some of the slack of where we can't handle pigs. Um, some, of, some of the fosters are willing to take groups of pigs, like when we have a hoarding situation. We have a woman now who's uh, fostering 12 males for us and they came from a hoarding situation and the females went to another lady. So we we do a lot of outreach. We'll go and neuter all those, in fact, we had it scheduled to get all those boys neutered, but um, we had to cancel because of recent rains and stuff and the cold weather, but we'll get all those, neuter all those animals and then try to start getting them into homes, but it's difficult because most of the hoarding situations, the pigs are very, very wild and they've never been socialized at all. And it's it's really uh, not what people want as a pet. You know, they want a pig that they can handle and pet and be a companion. So um, that's the other thing about pigs. They're not they're not like a cat or a dog. They, they don't, they're prey animals. So they tend to be afraid you know, and it takes time to socialize them and you have to sit with them and be patient and um, spend time and just, you know, some people say pick them up. It's not a good idea to pick them up because they need to come to you and be curious and you give them a few little treats of some kind and they'll start to trace, trust you and walk on you. And, you know, slowly you have to deal with pigs. It's not, it happens in, and people get a they'll go out and buy a little baby pig or something and get it to their house and it's not friendly and they can't really relate to it. So uh, they don't want them. And that happens a lot. So you, 
you got to have a lot of patience if you're going to uh, adopt a pig or or deal with a pig. So it's it's a whole different realm. <laughs> So, and then I just, if you could speak to, uh, these are all pot belly pigs, right? As opposed to other kinds of pigs. Ours are all pot bellies. We have, we have a couple hogs. We've had it over the years. We usually have one or two hogs, but primarily we do not deal with hogs. We have some cooney coonies. Those are large, a lot, quite a lot larger than, than pot belly pigs are. Uh, they're very, very friendly animals. Very sweet. And um, we got them from a hoarding situation out in uh, uh, to the west end, west side of Tucson, and um, they're they're fun to have because they're very they're very uh, affectionate, you know. And they'll come up and sit, lay with you, and whatever, uh, even more so than pot bellies will. Um, but primarily, we have pot bellies. But you know, it doesn't preclude the fact that. Hogs are equally, equally friendly and like that if they're if they're if they're socialized when they're young as well. And they have all the same sensitivities and um, the same um, fears and and need for affection that that a pot belly pig will have. So I, I used to like we when we would do tours, we had a couple some hogs that we always walked by that area and that people saw the hogs they've all passed on now but but it was nice for them to get that experience of seeing that you know hogs are real sensitive affectionate sentient beings that need and deserve the same thing that any other animal deserves and they're terribly mistreated as you know so um i, I like people to know that it's been kind of nice to have hogs on the property at least a couple but they're a whole different category of, of uh, keeping them uh, contained and um, medical care. A pot belly pig, we can go out and flip it over and trim its feet and toxic and uh, lance an abscess or, you know, whatever. But hogs, you can't. And it's, it's, it's a whole different. They're very strong and obviously very big. So we try to shy away from hogs the best we can. And the overpopulation is affecting all, like hogs as well as pot bellies, or more. It's more of a problem with the pot. Well, it's hogs pot bellies. and pot bellies, but but hogs obviously we don't we don't hear too much about them. I mean, people will occasionally call us, and there's a stray hog or something. Um, mostly, that's because they want it from somebody who has them to to eat. You know, and we try to, on occasion, we've taken those in, but um, we took one from California once and we've taken them from here to a couple times. But mostly um, the overpopulation is, is in the pot belly pig realm. And, uh, and it's, it's gotten to a point where, as we talked about the other day, there's no agency to handle this. And, um, you know, there's, animal control and humane societies for um, for dogs and cats and, and other animals. But uh, surprisingly, they don't take pigs. And I California, some of the shelters do take pigs. Uh, in Arizona, they don't. And the agriculture department will, will sometimes pick up a pig uh, if it's a stray like today that, that the agriculture department is going out. But um, but they they don't keep them. There's no facility to keep them. So they try to find uh, they try to find a, a rescue that will take them in. Like we got called to take this one in. And um, so the burden of the overpopulation of of potbelly pigs is on sanctuaries and rescues because there's just no there's no governmental agency that will that will deal with them. And uh, they usually won't pick them up. Sometimes our animal control facility will pick them up if they're a nuisance. You know, if they're a nuisance to somebody, they're in somebody's yard or they're on the street and causing a hazard or something, and then they call us. And um, but that's what has to happen. And and we really need agencies in this country 
to deal with the overpopulation of pot bellied pigs and face the fact that, you know, people are breeding them and there's too many of them and there's not homes for all of them. So they need to take responsibility and, and uh, start make, having facilities to deal with them and learning how they, they won't try to adopt them because they say they don't know what pigs need and they don't know how to adopt them. And so, and they don't want to spay and neuter them mostly. And so it's a, it's a big, it's a big issue. And one of the worst issues is that they want it both ways. The agencies won't take them because they're considered swine, but yet the pot belly pig breeders say they're like dogs and they'll be 30 or 40 pounds and they're domestic pets. So are they pets or are they swine? I mean, you know, so it, it's like they want it both ways. You know, they use the excuse that they're not going to take them because they're swine. And yet, and yet they don't close the breeders down. They don't say, you know, I mean, because the breeders call them domestic pets. So it's really a dilemma for pigs in this country. It's a, it's a big dilemma. Right. And what I'm learning from you is there's also such, um, generally speaking, you have no shelters. It all, it's just up to the sanctuaries to take care of the whole issue of the overpopulation um, yeah. of all these animals that are being bred and then people don't responsibly care for them. They don't, they don't realize what they're getting into or for whatever their reasons are. Okay. Well, we, we couldn't be more grateful to you, Mary and your team there for what you're doing for these precious animals. Of course, obviously there's a whole other issue of, you know, it would help if people would recognize how precious they are and that they aren't only, um, you know, an animal to, to, to torture and consume, right? Because there's all of that whole other issue that people just look at them as bacon, right? Um, That's right. And they miss the beauty really. of these animals entirely. And and apparently there is a lot about just how intelligent they are and how smart they are and how clean they are as farm animals, but you have to know how to care for them like you guys do. So, okay, yes. well, we're going to put in the show notes links to your website. And I just thank you again for taking the time to talk with us. Um, Anything else, any final comments you want to make? I would just like to say they really are wonderful animals. They really are. They're, they're, they're a delight to have and uh, in the proper homes and where people can accept them as they are, you know. And, I mean, they're independent. Uh, they, you know, but they, they're very affectionate. And, um, you know, they're just really wonderful animals. They're, 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 they cause you to smile and laugh a lot and and uh, and and they they love people they get very attached they get very bonded to people and to their their companions and um it, it just you just have to be careful and not have expectations that are not realistic about what you what you're getting into and and i have had people many people that donate to us and write letters and they say you know i had just so and so for 17 years and and it was the best pet i ever had so in the right homes they're absolutely wonderful to have <laughs> and we love them here <laughs> all 650 of them <laughs> yes well and hopefully listeners I, I really think it you know i just so appreciate your time and helping educate us and that's a big part of what we're doing here is just having the conversations to help each other understand what the problems are what the reality what the need is what the opportunity is that definitely if you have you know if you're if you have a farm and it's zoned and you have access to veterinary care um you could be a perfect foster or you could be a perfect adopter of a beautiful animal um yeah. just to kind of get it out of your head this sort of idea we have of the what do they call them the teacups or the minis yeah. or whatever that's just a made up branding that doesn't exist right that's right that's right yeah that these that's animals right. will grow mm -hmm. you know and they're going to grow to be um, who they are you know 
And they are who they are, right. And and we love dogs and they are not dogs, right? They're mm -hmm. a different precious species. Um, That's absolutely right. Things, yeah. So, well, again, well, we're going to the link for listeners in the show notes, how to make donations to the Ironwood Pig Sanctuary, how to find you, how to schedule a visit. And I appreciate, you know, not right now while you're dealing with this illness. I did see that on your website that you give people notice about that. So hopefully that gets cleared up quickly for all of you. And again, I can't thank you enough. And I hope for listeners, it's all been worth your while. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning in to Vale La Pena. Please join us in making an impact together for people, animals, and the environment. Details in the show notes. You can find this show through my website at www.rebuslegal.com and on YouTube, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. I'm your host, Cynthia Rebus. And I welcome and thank you for your feedback, comments, questions, and sharing this show with others.